For those of you whom I may not know, my name's Bill Rich. I'm the Senior Associate for Christian Formation here at Trinity, and it's a pleasure to welcome you here to the first of our three Price Lectures for this Lent. Uh, on each of the chairs, you have not only a Bible, but a handout, and on the back of the handout, it will explain to you what the other two Price Lectures are about. I'm not going to go into detail, but I do want to point out to you that two weekends from now, uh, Walter Brueggemann, uh, probably the leading Old Testament scholar of his generation, will be with us for the weekend. He'll be with us on Saturday morning. He'll be with us on Sunday as our preacher and as a forum leader, and then again on Sunday afternoon as our Christ lecturer. So, um, highly recommend that if you can carve out time in your schedule um, that weekend, which is the last weekend of, of March, that you do so. And then the weekend after that, um, uh, Dr. John Levinson from Harvard Divinity School, who's written one of the books that had the most impact on my rethinking um, uh, the Abraham uh, and Isaac story, the so-called binding of Isaac, and uh, also Jesus' own death and resurrection, will be with us. So I hope you can be with us for one or both of those. Let me say a word historically about what the Price Lectures are, and then I'm going to have the privilege of introducing our Price Lecturer for today. The Price Lectures were founded by a virtue of the will of a vestryman of this parish in the 18th century. So if you think your legacy may not last, <laughs> think again. Um, William Price, um, in his will, uh, left a, a pile of money uh, to Trinity Church with the stipulation that um, lectures be done in his name uh, every Lent. He also told us what the topics should be. Um, we have since departed from those um, for reasons I won't go into right now. Um, William Price uh, wanted these to be free and open to the public, and so they are to this day. He asked that a free will offering be taken. There is a basket on the table back by that clock, um, and I hope after you hear about his generosity, you'll want to be generous too. Um, his generosity took this form. He said, I want the Price Lectures to be a trinity, but I want the free will offering to be divided uh, between uh, two other places. <laughs> Old North Church, uh, the, the famous um, Paul Revere Church up in the North End, and King's Chapel, which is no longer an Anglican church. It is uh, actually the first Unitarian uh, church in New England. And so to this day, we take a free will offering and we send it out. So again, um, you might want to think about your own life and um, generosity and how it might have a ripple effect hundreds of years from now. Who knows? Welcome uh, to this first Price Lecture. It's my privilege to introduce to you our lecturer for today, who is Judy Fentress Williams. She's professor of Old Testament at Virginia Theological Seminary. Her studies, um, undergraduate studies, were at, at Princeton University, and then um, her graduate studies, both her Master's of Divinity and her PhD, are from Yale, um, where I did my own Master's of Divinity. And by the way, um, in a kind of rivalry that we have here among the clergy, we now completely outnumber Sam, who studied at the August Institution where Judy is teaching, uh, but the rest of us all studied Yay! <laughs> I can say all of this, of course, because Sam is away. And, uh, actually, he, he said the same thing this morning at, at uh, announcements. So, um, prior to her uh, appointment at Virginia, um, Judy was a member of the faculty at the Hartford Seminary uh, as professor of Hebrew Bible, and she also was the director of the Black Ministries program there. And she's written a commentary on the topic we're going to hear about today, uh, a commentary on Ruth. This is available in our shop. Uh, Judy has graciously agreed to do book signing afterwards, so I hope you'll be <laughs> generous to the price lecture offering and then go and buy a book <laughs> and get Judy to sign it. Um, enough from me. Uh, join me in welcoming our price lecturer, Dr. Judy fenters -Lick. I want to tell you what an honor and a privilege it is to be here with all of you today. 
and how impressed I am with Trinity Church. I um, went to your website and was delighted to see how much there was on your website about the Bible. And then I was even more delighted to see how much you had on the Old Testament. So you have a friend in me already, and I'm delighted that you're doing this work together. I want to talk to you today about the Book of Ruth, and I want to describe my lecture as um, a Ruth, a dialogue around identity, a conversation around identity. And my premise here is that identity is a construct, that you were born into the world, and an identity is something that is formed around you based on the values of your culture. And so different cultures have different values, and those are the things that come to the fore when we begin to say who we are. And it's also the case, you will notice, that when you move from one location to another, your identity can change. So it's been my experience as a working woman that when I am at work, people actually listen to what I say. <laughs> but when I return home, I experience an identity shift. And all of a sudden, everyone is deaf and we no longer have this authority. But it is the case. When we move from place to place, we change. We can move from being in the minority to being in the majority. We can move from being someone who doesn't have power to someone who does, based on space. We want to think about those implications when we look at a story like that of Ruth that involves shifts in location. So what I'd like to do is set out the platform that we will use and then move through at least the first two chapters so that we'll look in each of these chapters and focus on location and then the dialogue that takes place in that chapter and how those two things inform identity of the characters. Now, Ruth is only four chapters long, so if we don't finish, you can go home and finish the book within 40 minutes and feel very, and probably less than that, and feel very proud of yourself. So I invite you to do that. Before I go any further, how many of you have read the book of Ruth? Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's fabulous. So then I'm going to make this really, um, so then I, I'll move through this fairly quickly. Let me first start by talking about the where, what, and how of this book. In other words, where is the book of Ruth? If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Ruth. I heard someone over here talking about where it was, so if you don't know, it's right after Judges. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. So you don't have to go that far in, all right? You go in the middle of your Bible, you've gone too far. Page 187. <laughs> now, here's what I want you to know. The book of Ruth wasn't always there. So if we were to look in the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Bible has three divisions. The first division is Torah, or what we call Pentateuch. And those are the first five books of the Bible. Torah gets translated as law, and that is the most unfortunate term. Torah really means teaching, or to throw out. So the first five books are teaching. Then we move to the middle section. So we go from law to prophets. And in the middle section, we have Joshua and Judges, but then we would move forward to the books of Samuel and Kings and all of the books that are named after prophets, that are in fact prophetic texts. The third division of the Hebrew Bible is called the Writings, or Ketuvim, and that has everything else, including a group of five books that belong on the festival scroll called the Megillot. Ruth is one of the five books. These books are associated with celebrations or holidays. So we talked today about Esther and the celebration of Purim. So Esther's in there, and Ruth is in there, and Song of Songs, and Kohelet, and Lamentations, because each one of those books is associated with a festival within the liturgical life of Judaism. And Ruth is associated with the Feast of Weeks, which is seven weeks, 49 days after the giving of the law. And for those of you who are really astute with your liturgical calendars, that is one day prior to what would be the celebration of Pentecost. All right? So we have this celebration that comes seven weeks after the celebration of the giving of the law. Now it gets even more interesting because Ruth doesn't just stay there. Within those five books, Ruth moves around. 
So you've got this festival scroll, but it's ordered differently in different traditions. Sometimes Ruth is after the book of Proverbs. Sometimes Ruth is after the book of Song of Songs. So give me 30 more seconds and I'll tell you why that matters. Proverbs ends with chapter 31. And does anybody remember anything about Proverbs 31? It's also written women. Oh, it's the one they pull out on Mother's Day in some churches, that, right? A woman of valor, who can find? And I hate that passage because who can be that woman? She does all these things, right? She gets up in the morning and she buys bread and she clothes her family in linen and she sells things and she's very busy. This woman in Proverbs 31 is described as a woman, woman of valor, but what I want to draw your attention to is the word for strength or valor is hail. And it is rare that a woman is described in this way. Hail is a term that has to do with a man being strong. But we have this example in Proverbs 31, a woman of strength and the book of Ruth. Ruth is described as a woman of Hail or valor. So it's really interesting that we would move from that last chapter of Proverbs to then describe this woman, Ruth. The other place where Ruth might find itself in this festival scroll is after the Song of Songs. Now, what do you all know about the Song of Songs? <laughs> you ask. <laughs> yes, what? Sex. Sex, yes. Um, what? It's love for. It's love, yes. It's love. It's not just sex. It's love. It's sensuality. It is a celebration of what it means to be embodied and part of the creation. And so, and the thing about Song of Songs is that it's very sensual, but there's not a whole lot of sex. There's a whole lot of longing or desire for this union. And so then we move from this longing and desire in Song of Songs to a story that actually ends in the union of these two people. All right? So Ruth, third division of the Hebrew Bible on a festival scroll, and it bounces around a little bit there. When the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek, that's what we call the Septuagint, the translator said, well, looky here. The story begins in the days when the judges ruled. Let's put it after judges, after all, because it begins in the days when the judges rules, ruled, and it ends by talking about King David. So it has this lovely place with these historical bookends that puts it right in between Judges and Samuel. And that's why we turn to this place to find the story. OK. Now, because you've all, or almost all of you, have read this story, I'm going to tell you about it really, really quickly. Um, there's this guy, and his name is Elkanah. He has this lovely family. There's a famine. They move to Moab. And there, all of the men in the family die. Naomi, Elkanah's wife, is left by herself with these two daughters-in-law. She comes back to her hometown with the daughters-in-law. Halfway there, there's a moment where she wants to send them back. One goes back. One stays with her. The one who stays with her is Ruth. And the rest of the story focuses on what happens to them when they return to Bethlehem. They do not have um, any wealth and they don't have the means of procuring wealth and so Ruth gleans and we'll talk about that a little later and in the process of gleaning she meets this guy named Boaz and then through another set of circumstances they end up getting married and we'd like to think they lived happily ever after I don't know but they have children and they become the um, ancestors of David that's the short version if you want the really good version you have to read it for yourself all right? That's basically what happens in four chapters. If you look at the structure of Ruth, it looks very much like what we would call a comedy. In other words, if you think about a comedic structure in literature, things start off really great, and then things go bad. And then through a series of events, things are returned to some semblance of order, but the characters have been transformed. And so Ruth follows the pattern of a comedy. And we can then think of it in that sense. I like to call it a dialogic comedy, because it seems to me one of the most important characteristics about the Bible is that the Bible is a text in dialogue. Are you all with me? OK. 
Am I going too fast? Okay, I'm trying to fit a lot in. Okay, what do I mean by that? I believe that the Bible was designed so that we listen to more than one voice at once. So when I was in college and I took a religion course, I was taught that there were all of these different sources that contribute to the Bible. The Bible comes from a variety of different writers, different oral traditions, with different perspectives. That means a couple of things. It means anything that's worth saying in the Bible is going to be said more than once. And it also means that the Bible feels no compulsion to tell it the exact same way both times. And this is a problem for people who want to read the Bible and have it have meaning for their lives because you see two stories and you want to know which one. What do I do? And the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. It's not. Yes. So what I want to suggest to you is that the Bible is not asking us to choose, but it's asking us to enter a conversation. So can I give you a really quick example? Go to the first, the beginning of your Bible, Genesis chapter 1. <coughs> Genesis chapter 1 begins with this lovely, lovely chapter, um, which our Walter Brueggemann actually calls a liturgical poem, um, that starts by talking about how God creates the world. In the beginning, or at the start, when God begins to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void, darkness covered the face of the deep, and we get this whole story about God creating the earth in seven days. And there's a pattern. The pattern is God says, it happens, and then it's good. God says, it happens, it's very good. And then, evening and morning. So that we have this lovely pattern of repetition that takes us through creation in a series of six days, then there's a day of rest, which is the seventh day, and we get this lovely hallowing of the Sabbath. Beautiful and ordered. And it should not come as a surprise to us when we learn that that was written by the priestly writer, because the priests liked order, right? We like that, that's good. Somebody's gotta keep track of these things. Then you move to the second story, and it is immediately messier. Look at Genesis 2. Chapter 4. <laughs> I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 4. And we're going to read 4b. So if we divide this verse and start with in the day, do you, you all see that? Yes. All right, here, listen to this. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise up from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. <laughs> then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. That's one sentence. <laughs> All right? Now, if you were an English teacher, you would be unhappy with this sentence. It is already messy, because you can't say one thing without adding another thing and another thing. So we move into this second creation story, and we have God making the man, and then God's like, okay, now i got to do something with him. So God puts him in a garden. Um, okay, he needs to eat, so God provides him with food. He's lonely. God creates animals. Nope. Animals. animals. It's a trick question. This is the craziest story if you read it. It's almost like trial and error. And then Adam names all the animals and surprise, surprise, no, no one was there. No, there was another human being. So God then makes Eve. So you have these two very different stories. And if you can resist the temptation to pick one, you could see that both of these stories want to tell you something about the nature of creation. Let's assume for the moment that our language is insufficient to describe what God did in creation. And if our language is insufficient, then the best way to get at it is to tell more than one story. These two stories work together beautifully in that the first story is temporal and the second story is spatial. Six days, garden, center of the universe, all there. And so time and space would be the two elements that characterize what it means to be a part of the created order. We are bound by time and space. The other thing I like about the dialogue between these two stories is that it suggests to us that God, in Genesis 1, has a plan. I really like that. 
God in Genesis 2 is flexible, and I like that too. Because even though God has a plan, if you're human and you live for more than 45 seconds, you are going to move away from the plan. And it's good to know that God is flexible. God is big and on high. God is close and intimate. And so this text is trying, if we start at the beginning, to say, if you're going to engage this God, you're going to have to listen to more than one voice at the same time. Because the story we want to tell you is bigger than our words. Reading the Bible is like reading music. So you, you all read music. This is, this is one of, so I'm reading music. The words are here in the middle. The notes are up here. And I've got to train my eye to figure out what's happening here and also down here, or to read ahead to see what the, the words are so that I can, you know, I don't come in too soon or hold a note too long. And you can learn to do that. Learning to look at the different parts on the line. That's what reading scripture is like. So once we open ourselves up to that, a whole realm of possibilities come to us. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that reading the Bible is easy. I'm not going to lie to you and say that the Bible is always charming. The Bible is sometimes extremely difficult and terribly offensive, but it is also full of wonder. And if you enter into the conversation, you may be surprised at what you discover. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes our difficult texts that we encounter are difficult because we are engaging one part of the dialogue and not the other. I believe that there are passages of scripture that are engaging with, in dialogue with other passages of scripture, and there are a couple of examples of that in the story of Ruth that I'll try to point out to you if time permits. And when we see that, we are then witnessing the time when a text is revisiting something that the community doesn't feel comfortable with either. So we come back and we want to revisit that story and say something else about it. All right, are we good? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we talked about where it is, we talked about what happens, and we talked about this dialogic tradition in the text. The Bible is text in dialogue, and that means that in the Bible we have what I call tradition and counter tradition. And I'll give you a couple of examples of this. Tradition is the way it's supposed to be. Counter-tradition is the way it is. Here's an example. In the ancient Near Eastern world, the oldest male who is first born is the one who inherits the biggest portion, gets the birthright, and is also the one who inherits the blessing. That almost never happens. Right? That's the tradition. But Abraham has a firstborn son whose name is Ishmael. And it's the secondborn son who carries on the blessing. Isaac has twins, Esau and Jacob. Who gets it? The secondborn. And then Jacob marries Leah and Rachel. Leah's the firstborn. Who does he love? The secondborn. And so on and on and on we see, here's the way it's supposed to be, but that's not always the way it happens. The scripture holds tradition and counter-tradition in tension. Now I think this is fascinating because even though scripture holds those two together, most of us still tend to read for the tradition, forgetting that that is rarely the way that it works. Which means we need to, as we learn to read, train ourselves to look for God in the margins or in the unexpected places. Because often, God's working in the counter tradition. Okay? The other thing I want to say about a dialogic approach to the text is that we need to remember that in the same way that language isn't big enough to tell the whole story, it's also the case that words have many possibilities for meaning. Um, so I um, grew up in the Northeast, moved to Virginia to VTS about 12 years ago, and it took me about 18 months to realize that when you hear a Southern woman say, bless his little heart, <laughs> that's not a compliment. <laughs> If you were to see them on paper, it would look just fine. But if you heard it, you would hear something.
something differently. Words serve multiple functions. And as soon as you take that in, how do you know when you're reading something and it's not that voice? When is it possible that there is irony or sarcasm in this text? And how do we begin to open that up? What are the possibilities for meaning in scripture? All right? So what I want to do is look at Ruth as a dialogue around identity. Oh, there's one more thing I have to say. Um, oh, there are many things I have to say, but one more thing I have to say right now. Um, when we talk about identity, I want you to think for a moment about the way in which Israel develops its identity. Remember I said identity is a construct. Um, this morning's scripture lesson was Genesis 12, where God calls Abram. And this is the moment where this nation's origins are placed. That God called an individual and said, I will make of you a great nation. Israel's identity is founded on the premise that they were called by God to be God's people. That's nice. The other side of that is that we have then a religious tradition that by definition, in order to exist, has to have an other. If there's an us, then there's a them. And so the tension in the literature of this material is, what does it mean to be set apart unto God? And what does it mean for everybody else? Okay? The reason I am intrigued by this is because when you read through the Old Testament, you can observe the creation of other. What do I mean? If you follow the narrative, the Bible makes the case that everybody came from Adam. Now, if that's the case, everybody's related. So how do we get foreigners? Well, where do they come from? And if you look in the Bible, you can see where they come from. The Edomites are the descendants of Esau. The Moabites, who's a Moabite? Ruth. 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 Do y'all know where the Moabites come from? Moab Desert. They come from Moab, who said that. There's one in every crowd. Okay. <laughs> this, is a re this is really important. Genesis chapter 19 begins with the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. It ends with the story of the origins of the Moabites and the Ammonites. Lot leaves with his daughters. His wife is turned into a pillar of salt. They go up into these mountains. Genesis 19, write it down. I'm not making it up. You can go read it. And his daughters say to one another, our people will die out if we don't do something. And so each of his daughters <coughs> sleep with their father. Did y'all know this story was a joke? And the daughter names, well, the one daughter names her son Moab, from father. That's, yeah. Amoni, my people, are the names of these children. When you read the story, you observe how Israel makes other. One of the ways we make other is to, to associate them with something that is so awful that we cut them off. Okay? So the Moabites and the Ammonites, so every time you say that, Ruth the Moabite, well, you know where they came from. <laughs> Think about it. This is an intentional thing because whether they like it or not, the Israelites share blood with the Moabites. They're blood relatives. But there is a process of othering. Regina Schwartz has a book called The Curse of Cain. And in it, she wrestles with this question. What does it mean to have a religious identity that is based on or founded upon putting somebody else out? And the challenge that we are faced with. And the thing she says that I love in this book is that othering is the first act of violence. Yeah. 
Think about it. One of the things that people say all the time, I'm a professor of Old Testament, so people say, I don't like the Old Testament, it's so violent, God's so angry. Because we, in the year 2014, are not violent at all. <laughs> right? So, if you think about physical violence, but understand that you do not perpetrate physical violence against someone until you have decided they are not you that you are not connected with them. So the act of othering, which we do every day in our comfortable little seats, is what allows the second act of violence to take place. So I'm intrigued with the fact that in the story of Ruth, you have a story about a Moabitess who comes into the family of Israel. Right. This is a big deal, and it's important to point out because we like Ruth so much, we forget where she came from. People who are telling this story, they did not forget where she came from. Randy Bailey has an article where he describes the Moabites as incestuous bastards. <laughs> you laugh, but every time Israel would hear Moabite, that's what they're thinking. So what would happen if we read the story of Ruth and said, instead of Ruth the Moabite, Ruth that incestuous bastard? Because that's how we make somebody other. We keep remembering the thing that we want to use to separate them or push them away. Okay? Think about the language we use even today when we talk about um, immigrants communities and people who have come here and don't have their paperwork. There's, there's immigrant and then there's alien. So think about the language we use. Okay, back to the text. So what I want to do is start with chapter one. Are you all with me? Yeah. Any questions so far? Are we good? Yeah. Okay, chapter one. I'm going to read the first five verses. Now, four chapters, and can I say, this is one of the most beautifully constructed books in the Bible. Sometimes the Bible is messy, but Ruth is not one of those books. Four chapters, each chapter has three sections, each chapter has a section of dialogue, so that in the book there are more verses of direct dialogue than there are verses of narrative which is remarkable. And there's this lovely pattern we can follow. So chapter one, we divide into three parts. Verses one through five give us the setting for the rest of the story. Verses six through 18 are the central dialogue. And then verses 19 to 22 provide the platform for the ensuing action. So we have these two kind of narrations, and in the middle is the dialogue. Now, if we're talking about identity and location, it's in the conversation that we have an opportunity for people's identity to change. Okay? All right, here we go. Uh, wrong book. It's getting ready to read in the beginning. Here we go. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab. He, his wife, and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malan and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. When they had lived there for about 10 years, both Malin and Killian also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons or her husband. Okay, five verses, and a lot happens. So we have this setting in the days that the judges ruled. There's a famine in the land. What happens in agrarian communities when there's a famine? You move. It happens all the time. So they move, this man moves to Moab. That's curious because of what we know about the Moabites. Then we find out a little bit more. 
His name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and we have these two sons. Look at how he is introduced before you hear his name. He begins, we're introduced to him as a certain man, and then we are told where he's from. Bethlehem in Judah. The way the story is set up is an indicator to what the markers are of identity within this culture. So in this community, your identity is formed by your family, your kinship group, and your homeland. So I'm sure it's, it happens in New England as well, but down south, you would say we're the Joneses from Suffolk County, not to be confused with those other people, the other Joneses. So that there's this sense then of people being connected, family, this larger family group, and where your people are. It is also the case in the south, and in the ancient Near East, and in many African countries, that it is on the homeland that you bury your ancestors. Your people are buried in a particular place. And that is central to your identity. Remember at the end of the book of Genesis when Joseph says, when you all leave up on out of here, take my bones. Because even if I die here, eventually my bones need to find their resting place at our familial home. So we know that there are many cultures for whom identity is connected to name, family group, and burial ground. That's why we get started by hearing where he's from before we find out what his name is. Elimelech means my God is king. Naomi means pleasant. Malin and Killian, not such happy names. Sickness and destruction. Um, so you know what's going to happen. Then it says they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. So pay attention here. We not, we're not only told that they're from Bethlehem, but we're told what kind of region of Bethlehem, which suggests that this is a family of substance, which raises the question as to why they move in the first place. Because if there's a famine in your people of substance, you can probably last a little longer. Um, there's some midrash that suggests that Elkanah, I'm sorry, not Elkanah, Elimelech left because he didn't want to share his goods with everyone else. Um, we don't know about that, but that's one of the um, possibilities. The other thing I want to point out is that if you look at the names, Bethlehem, does anyone know what Bethlehem means? House of Bread. Oh, here we go, House of Bread. And Ephratha, does anyone know what Ephratha means? So I heard it. Somebody said it. They're whispering, fruitful. So fruitful, house of bread, famine. There's this contrast there. All right? So they go to Moab, and then the famine that we have in the homeland seems to visit this family because now the husband and the husband dies. The sons marry Moabite women. And that's a kind of death. Because this is a terrible thing for your sons to marry these kind of women. And they die after 10 years. And why does it matter that we hear that they die after 10 years? No kids. No kids. So it's another kind of famine. OK? Because 10 years, come on, people, that's enough time. So, <laughs> so there's death. And then there's no new life, and then there's death again. That's how the story begins, all right? And then it tells us at the end, so that the woman was left without her two sons or her husband. Does anyone notice anything peculiar about that? Thank you. So it's about Naomi. It's not about Orpah or Ruth. They lost their husbands, but somehow they don't factor in, because this is a story about an, out, an upstanding Israelite family. All right? Then we move to verses 6 to 18, and we don't have time to go through the whole dialogue. Oh, my word. We don't have time to go through the whole dialogue. Actually, let's spend a little time and just do chapter 1, if that's all we have time for. Um, I just want to point out a few things. Um, first it says, she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had had consideration for his people and given them food. They are starting to move. 
If identity is shaped by location, I want you to pay attention to how many times Moabite or Moabitess gets mentioned in the next few sections. All right? Because some of the words that are used to describe us are only used when we're in certain locations. All right? So this goes to this shift of identity with location. So she starts to return. So she set out from the place. So in verse 6 it says she started to return. Verse 7, so she set out from the place where she had been living. She and her two daughters-in-law. And they went on their way. Three times it sounds like she's starting out. She starts out. She set out. They went on their way. Okay, they're moving. They're moving. <laughs> but, but Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's house. They start going. They start going. They're on their way. And at a certain point, Naomi stops and tells her daughters-in-law to go back. Why does it happen after they start to move? Why don't you just leave them there? Anybody want to take a stab at it? To give them choice. Yes. To give them a choice. Why didn't she give them a choice before they leave? Because they're healthier. Maybe, maybe. That's a good point. Wait, I never thought about that. Maybe she's beginning, as she moves closer to home, beginning to think about what it means to bring two Moabite widows back. Mm -hmm. Or did they, were they... Um, were they by other Moabites? Because they married Israelites? I don't know. If so, it would have made sense for them to come. Mm -hmm. Right? So they start to move. They start to move. As they get closer, she wants to give them the opportunity to go back. And I like to think that she is giving them a choice because she says to them, May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. It sounds as though Naomi wants to give them an opportunity to have some semblance of happiness because she has nothing to offer them. All right? So I think this thing she wants to give them is a good thing. Um, but they don't want to go. She kissed them. They wept aloud. They said, no, we will return with you to your people. And I always love this. How do you return to a place you've never been? They say, we will. so is it that we will return with you? We will go back with you. All right? But Naomi says, turn back. Why would you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb? She goes off for a little bit here. Do I still have sons in my womb that I may become your, that may become your husbands? Turn back. Go your way. I'm too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me. Even if I should have a husband this night and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown up? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters. It's been far more bitter for me than for you because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. They wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So they come to a point in the journey where Naomi offers them an opportunity to have a better life, or what appears to be a better life. And her reasoning is, I can't give you anything. I don't have any husbands left for you. And she says, return to your mother's house, not your father's house. Because we often think that the mother's house would be the place, or the mother would be the one to find another suitable <coughs> husband. That this is, and she wants them to have rest. Um, there's some conversation amongst contemporary readers around what the obligations of these women would have been. Um, there are many cultures um, where once you marry that husband, you are married to that family. So even if he dies, you are not going anywhere. And if that's the case here, then again, Naomi is offering a gift. Okay? And this is a wonderful thing. Um, then she says, your sister-in-law's gone back, return. And this is this famous line we have where Ruth says to Naomi, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people, my people. Your God, my God. Listen to the next part. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. So remember what we said about burial lands and burial grounds. She's saying, I'm not only going where you're going, I'm going to be buried right up underneath you. We are family. If Ruth and Orpah were bound to this family when they married Malin and Killian, Ruth is effectively renewing her vows to this family. This is what we call um, performative speech. 
She says it, and it's happening. It's like what happens. I just did a wedding yesterday afternoon, and they say, I, so-and-so, take you, so-and-so. Performative speech. When I say it, it's happening. When Ruth says this, it's happening. And she's saying, I am going to be buried where you are buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. So this is interesting because she makes a vow using God's personal name, and she's not even an Israelite. Okay? Interesting. Um, when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Naomi couldn't do anything because now Ruth has invoked a vow. May God do something so terrible I can't even say what it is if even death parts me from you. So Ruth connects herself to Naomi in a way that Naomi cannot undo. Okay? And so now we have this formation of this family unit. Now, look at the last section. Okay, 19 to 22. Oh, um, the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, call me no longer Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Okay, let's just stop there for a minute. They come back, and the crowd is stirred. They see these two women coming back. Is this Naomi? What's that all about? to figure out whether to welcome her or how to treat her. Is she an enemy? Is she a friend? Should I be nice to her? Should I? It's yeah. an suspect. It's an assessment, I think, of Good. this woman and the other woman. With her. And besides, she's a woman. She's not, yes. as they say, on your own. Yes. This is, this is really important because Naomi is coming back differently than she left. She left with a husband and two sons. She's coming back. None of those folks who left with her are coming back, and she's got this strange woman. And we don't even, she, it, time has passed. What does she look like? What is she wearing? Is there actually um, some, some attempt to recognize this person? I see this person, but I'm not sure I recognize them. So that we have in our brains the ability to recognize someone. And the way it happens is that your brain actually takes photographs of the people that you see on a regular basis. And so when I see someone I know, my brain goes into its little picture file and says, you know this person. Now, it also takes a picture of the environment in which you encounter that person. And this is why if you've ever seen, um, um, if you're a school teacher and your students see you in the supermarket, they get all wigged out because they know it's you, but they think you actually live in the classroom. And like, they, they do because they're young and that's where you belong, in that place. And so their brain says, I know that face, but the, the background is all wrong. So think about this kind of disconnect as these women are looking at Naomi. That is that Naomi? Is that not Naomi? And then Naomi comes in and says... Don't even call me Naomi. <laughs> call me Mara, which means bitter, because El Shaddai has dealt bitterly with me. Okay, I'm going to talk about two things here. Um, El Shaddai gets translated here as El, God, Shaddai, Almighty. Um, that word Shad has um, a, a, a relative word in Ugaritic that is Thod, that means breast. And so we're not sure. What is connoted by El Shaddai? Couple of possibilities. We traditionally think of El Shaddai as um, strong, powerful, mighty warrior deity. That is a possibility. It's another possibility that if we think of El Shaddai or El Thaddai as something connected to breast, that it conjures up um, characteristics of uh, goddesses in the ancient Near East, which is, uh, and, and goddesses in the ancient Near East were warriors to be contended with. This is not nice, sweet Mother Nature. 
these women were a force to be contended with. So whether it is feminine or masculine, you can go into this kind of warrior connotation. It's also the possibility that if we think about thought as breast, that it has to do with the strength or power to nourish and feed, to give life or take away life, which is an interesting connotation in a story about famine and harvest. That it is God who gives food, God who supplies or gives bread to his people after a famine. <laughs> The other thing I want to point out here in this section, look at Naomi's soliloquy and look at how many times we see the personal pronoun. Call me, no longer Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt with me, with me. I went way full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity beyond me? <laughs> Naomi <laughs> is caught up in how God has abandoned her. And the great irony of the story is that the woman yet to be named standing next to her is the person that God is going to use to bring life back to her. She can't even see it. She's standing there like she's by herself. God's been me. I'm alone. I'm me, me, me. And Ruth has just given up what could have been hers at home to be with Naomi. All right? And then it says, so Naomi returned together with Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who came back with her from the country of Moab. We get it. Right? The Moabite from Moab. Right? But look at how the text is, just in case you forget, she's a Moabite. She's from Moab. She is not our kind. And the text goes to such great effort to make her other. And I, we laugh, but you know we do this all the time. We go to great effort to make people other if we are not comfortable with them. And it, it's, it's reflected in our language. And so here it is. They came back to Bethlehem when? At the beginning of the barley. God's left me forsaken, I'm bereft. At the beginning of the barley harvest. So when we talk about recognition, the women are not sure they recognize Naomi. I don't think Naomi recognizes Ruth. Because if she did, maybe she would already begin to see what we see that unfolds here. Okay? Okay, um, so okay, let me give you a couple of options. We can, we can start in the next chapter. Do you want to go a little further? And then I want to skip to something else because I want to show you how the text refers to other stories. Okay? All right. Um, all right, chapter two. All right, the first three verses, I love these first three verses. Chapter two, verse one. Now Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a prominent rich man, a man of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Okay, so look at how he's introduced. Kinsman on her husband's side. Prominent rich man. All right, again, before we get his name, we get all these things. Um, of the family of Elimelech. We know that already because it says a kinsman on her husband's side, whose name was Boaz. Boaz means strength. When you look at the... Um, the temple that Solomon built, one of the pillars is named Boaz. Um, so that's his name. And Ruth, the Moabite. <laughs> Just in case you forgot, there it is again. I love it. Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of corn behind someone who, in whose sight I may find favor. She said to her, go, my daughter. So she went. She came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. As it happened, she came to a part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech, because we know that already. Okay, so here is, I love this because we get this little insider information before the action begins. You know, have you ever seen um, um, a soap opera? I'm telling too much about myself. In the old days, in the old days, if ever there was, a, it happens, in, oh, I've got a better example, it happens in drama, if you go to a play. 
Before the play begins, sometimes someone will come on the microphone and say the part of so-and-so will be played by the understudy and then name the person. It's almost like before the action begins, the narrator says, now Naomi has this relative. Unbeknownst to, you know, Ruth, there's this other player on the, on the playing field. Ruth wants to go glean. Do you all know what gleaning is? Gleaning is this provision that's given in the law that says widows and orphans need to eat. And that means when you harvest, listen United States of America, you don't take everything. You leave some for the people who do not have. Now here's the thing that's so intriguing to me. The Bible says in the law, in the legal material, it says you must let widows and orphans glean. In the same body of legal material, we have a law that says do not allow the Moabites into your congregation. Do not help them. Do not let them in for 10 generations. Which rule are we going to follow? Are we going to follow the rule that says don't let them in, or are we going to follow the rule that says take care of the widow and orphan? And I think there are times in communities of faith when we have to decide what is going to be the action that characterizes us as the people of God today. Okay, just leave that there. Um, now, so that's the, the narrative framework. Ruth is going to glean so that they can eat. Verses 4 to 16 is this lovely, lovely, lovely dialogue between um, Ruth and Boaz and his workers. So I'm just going to show you the first part because it's really funny. Um, so she just happens to go into the field that belongs to Boaz. So. This would not be so strange in a comedy, and that's why I think it's, it is a dialogic comedy, because in comedies, there are always these strange juxtapositions of characters and location. So there she is, and just as she gets there, just then, Boaz came from Bethlehem, just happened to be breezing through, all right? He said to the reapers, the Lord be with you, and what did they say? They said, the Lord bless you. Right? Now look at this. He says, hi. They say, hi. What is the next thing? To whom does this young woman belong? How did we go from hello to, to whom does this young woman belong? The servant who was in charge of the reaper said, she is the Moabite who came back with Naomi. From where? The country of Moab. Where else would a Moabite come from? So this is hilarious. So you've got Boaz just showing up. He wants to know where, who she belongs to, not who she is, because women belong to somebody. All right? And then we get she's the Moabite from Moab. Um, and then we get this little report about her. She comes, she gleans, she works hard, she's strong. This is all important. Then Boaz speaks to Ruth. So just think about staginess. Boaz comes in. He speaks to his people in charge. Who, to whom does that woman belong? She's the Moabite from Moab. She works really hard. Then he starts speaking directly to Ruth. Where is she? That she, so right, how does this happen? How is it that he goes from speaking to this person directly to this person? And this is what I want you to see in verse 8. Now listen, my daughter. Chapter 2, verse 2, Ruth says, Let me go glean among the ears of rain that I may find favor. And Naomi says, Go, my daughter. Here, is Ruth the Moabitess from Moab, or is she my daughter? So there's this, so Boaz introduces a different possibility of relationship. And it's in the dialogue that we have an opportunity to change our language that begins the shift in relationship. Okay? Think about that moment where Jesus tells the disciples, I call you friends. All right? that we have the power with language to begin to shift the landscape when we acknowledge that these others are our people. Okay? All right. All right. Um, let me just try to fit in like, two more little things. Okay. Um, remember in chapter 1 where it says that <clears throat> Malin and Killian marry Ruth and Naomi. And after they had lived in Moab for about 10 years, they both died. I'm intrigued with the 10 years, 
because of the rule that I told you about in Deuteronomy that says you shall not let the Moabites into your congregation for ten generations? Is there some kind of symbolic, some kind of symbolism going on that's saying it's time for them to come back? And is that why Orpah and Ruth say, we will return with you? That it's not just Ruth and Orpah returning, but the Moabites and the Ammonites returning. Why does this matter? Okay, I haven't got time. I'll get two more things and then I promise I'll stop. <laughs> I believe that the book of Ruth was written around the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, scholars are not all in agreement on this. So, older school was Ezra and Nehemiah. More recent studies say King David. And I, I'm not convinced by that. Um, but it's, it's an, an, an interesting argument. The reason I'm intrigued with the story being written around the time of Ezra and Nehemiah is because here in Ezra and Nehemiah, we have a community that has been in exile. They've been separated from their homeland. They've been separated from their temple and from their practices. And they're trying to figure out what does it mean to be an Israelite. They come back to the land. They rebuild the temple. And they send their foreign wives and children away. Strangest thing, it's one of these little disturbing stories where they read the law and they all start repenting. Oh, we've done all these terrible things. So they send their, where do they send their wives and children? It just, they send them away. So what would it mean if the book of Ruth had been written at the same time that the book of Ezra and Nehemiah came out? that here we now have two different visions of what it means to be the people of God. Are we, by definition, people who exclude? Or are we people who say, if we worship the same God, it's going to be all right? It's an interesting dilemma because it asks how we will understand ourselves. Are we a people set apart, or is there enough grace What's the right terminology? It's the difference between limited goods and abundance of goods. Why does that matter? Because we have famine and harvest. Is there enough grace for everybody to come? All right, one more reason that I think this is what's going on is because of the strange thing that happens in chapter 3. Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, chapter 3, verse 1, My daughter... My daughter, I need to seek some security for you so that it may be well with you. Now here's our kinsman Boaz, with whose young women you have been working. See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Now wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. She said to her, all that you tell me, I will do. Okay, so this is interesting because we have a problem with the text. In the text, it's what I call the problem of the pronouns. Because it says, uh, Naomi says, he's winnowing barley tonight, wash your clothes, and I will go down to the threshing floor. So in the Hebrew Bible, it doesn't say you go down, it says I go down. Who is going down to the threshing floor? <laughs> is it Ruth or is it Naomi? Now, there are a couple ways to solve this. One is that we can say, well, we've got some strange old pronomial suffixes. We can say they're working together as a team. But I'm intrigued by an interpretation by Cheryl Exum that says this story in structure is taking us back to Genesis chapter 19. Lot's two daughters say, look, our father, um, we're gonna, we need to secure our future. This is what we're going to do. After our father has eaten and after he's had something to drink, you will go and then I will go. So that structurally this passage is recalling the story that tells us how the Moabites and Ammonites became others in the first place and uses the same structure to help us understand how the Moabites and the Ammonites can return. You with me? Yeah. Okay. So that this sense then that they, how do they come back? The same way they came in. And that's what ties that together. 
And that's one of the ways that we come to figure out that, um, how can I say this? Um, that the survival of Naomi depends on Ruth. And that the survival of Israel in a post-exilic world may very well depend on them bringing in those that had been previously excluded. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop there. So, so we, do, do we have time for questions? Is that what we want to do? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
so that's something then that this community has to deal with. You know, this sense we have, the Israelites have of the purity of their race, not so much. Um, and so um, it's inviting us to acknowledge the fact that God can work even through these people. And then we go from David to Jesus. So then if you go to Matthew chapter 1, and you see the genealogy in Matthew, one of the things that's fascinating about it is the women that are mentioned. Um, Tamar in Genesis 38, who I believe is connected to Ruth because those are the two examples of um, full-blown deliberate marriage. Um, Rahab, um, Bathsheba, who is called the wife of Uriah, which I find very interesting, Ruth, and then Mary. And so those women, um, as a group, are either far are foreigners and or sexually suspect, which is a nice buildup to Mary because um, we forget how strange it would have been to have a young woman turn up pregnant and say the Holy Spirit did it. Um, that just would not have been something that was ever seen before. And so Matthew is, um, I think, being very subversive in that genealogy. Does that, does that? Help. Okay. By the way, an ad for the summer. Uh, we do a summer Bible study every year. This summer is going to be um, Ann Yulinoff's book about the female ancestors of Christ, which will look at all of the people in that genealogy, those, those five women just named. So. I know I, I wasn't that good, so there must be questions. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. My name's Patty. Uh, it's not really a question. I just was struck by say this, when you were talking about how the action and the identity changes in the dialogue mm -hmm. part of, and how structured the, the book is, mm -hmm. and and then you showed us a couple of examples of it, and I, it just made me think of your sermon this morning, mm -hmm. and when you were trying to encourage us to action, that that might change our identity. Yes. Yeah. So I'm just making a connection. Oh, good. Good. Thank you. Please. Um, my name's Wendy, and I'm really intrigued by the idea that this was written at the same time as um, Ezra and, and Nehemiah. And, and when you were talking about all the places that this book could be put, nowhere near it. <laughs> yeah, I want it to be Ezra and Nehemiah. I mean, I can't prove it, and neither can the folks who want it to be around the time of David. Um, I personally think there would be some real challenges, even if people knew that David had Moabite and uh, people in his family, I think that would have been a hard thing to say publicly at that time. So um, we try to date it based on the language. The problem is you can, depending on how you interpret things, you can argue in either direction. Yeah. Yes? Uh, my name's Rainey. Hi. So um, jumping ahead to the end, and maybe mm -hmm. this is not fair because we didn't get there, mm -hmm. but um, so I get the sort of inclusiveness of Ruth the Moabite, but then at the end, Ruth is married Boaz, and they have a child, and so you started 413, then the rest of it is all about Naomi. Yes. It's Naomi's child, Naomi takes yes. it, you know, and Ruth is yes. disappeared. Yeah. Yes, except... Is that like they couldn't stand, they couldn't... Well, I think it's part of the tension, but the name, the book is named after Ruth. Yeah. So it's like, yes, you can see that force that says, all right, now we've got this baby from this Moabite woman, we better put her back with a good Jewish mother as quickly as possible, because there, there's that tension in this culture um, around that. And, you know, so she becomes his nurse. Um, a child, a son has been born to Naomi. You know, I'm sure Ruth is like, uh, excuse me, I was there. Um, so, exactly, you know, Naomi's sitting there eating bonbons, I'm having a baby. So, you know, I think there's, this, I, there's a real tension there. But again, Ruth gets named in Matthew. So that they're, that's why I say the Bible has tradition and counter tradition. They're both there. Um, and our job is to always look for the counter tradition, because the tradition's easy enough to spot. It's the dominant voice. But to be able to see that, that counter voice that kind of erupts, um, Bakhtin is a literary um, theorist who would say that the chaos erupts into the narrative. And I think that the counter tradition breaks this open. Um, and if you think about it, that act, that kind of movement, that's kind of what the gospel does. The gospel breaks in and it breaks open. 
So it's, yeah, the other stuff's there. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Well, <clears throat> my name is Warren, and this is a question that I'm not sure there's an answer to. But what is the speculation as to the authorship of this? I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> I suspect it's mine. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for your speech. Um, I, I see the similarity between Mary and Ruth. I felt, I feel that both of them have very, are very strong, were very strong women. Uh, they did see, they may not have listened to uh, what people call them and always so readily. But in this case, both women seem to um, accept um, the, the situation readily and with joy. And I wonder, did God put his will upon these women's hearts? Or was it something about these women? Was it because they knew God in such a way that their heart was in harmony with God's heart? I, I do not know. I, um, I, I don't know. Um, all I know is what we have here. And, and we are told that biblical narrative has what we call gaps. It tells us something, but it doesn't tell us how to, what God did to their hearts. And so the gaps are invitations for us to step into that space and imagine and wonder. Um, and so long as we don't take what we imagine and wonder and force it on everyone else, um, it's a really good um, practice to get in there and, and imagine. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Me again, sorry, Lori. Um, would you care to comment on the what apparently happens at this service here, the climax, sexual climax of the story? <laughs> well, that's a little bit uh, leading. We don't know. <laughs> threshing floor. A threshing floor would have been a relatively high place because you're beating the grain and you want the chaff to blow away. It's a place associated with fertility and sexuality. And so the upon fertilize the female deity, which is the earth. And so um, that's kind of the, the basic or underlying myth. So now you have this high place associated with fertility, and Naomi sends Ruth under the cover of darkness. A lot of covering and uncovering in this chapter. Um, it, is really, it is, but it's really, I'm not looking at you. It's really great. <laughs> So she says, go, and after he's content to sleep, uncover his feet. Feet here is a euphemism for his genitals. And, and then lie down and he will tell you what to do. <laughs> what? We don't really know exactly what happens. He's highly suggestive. And then it says he wakes in the middle of the night, and there, a woman. What happened? And so even there, it's really interesting, because remember, in the ancient world, where fertility is so important. And, and, I'm, I'm, well, okay. This is, it matters greatly because um, we want to use the Bible to talk about human sexuality. And what we seem to forget is that the ancient world is obsessed with one thing and one thing alone, babies. You know, it is. If you look, and there are African cultures where you are not a man until you do two things. The first is get married, but the second is have a child. That's the real key. So it's almost unreasonable for us to then want to have this kind of, you know, apples and apples conversation. Because the seed or the semen is so precious that Boaz's fear may be that a night demon has stolen his semen. Okay, we have another name for that. 
Um, it's so that so that if uh, so you all know what I'm saying here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if a man had a nocturnal emission, that was that's you can't do that because you are wasting seed. All right. So is the fear? Yeah. I mean, so we need to. So when he wakes up and he's alarmed, is he afraid that that's what's happening? Um, so um, so. Um, so <laughs> So, um, in this situation, what we can say at least happens is that Ruth makes Boaz physically vulnerable, and she is vulnerable. And in that state of vulnerability, they make a preliminary covenant that then becomes covenant in the next chapter. Okay? Yeah. Well done. <laughs> well done. Right. Yes? How can I enroll in one of your courses? <laughs> Come to Virginia. Anything else? No more questions. Oh, no. Kate. Uh, my name's Kate, and I don't have another question, but I do think you were that good. So, is there anything else you want to share with us? <laughs> oh, um, I, I am just, I am so delighted you all are doing this kind of Bible work. Um, I, I teach at an Episcopal Seminary, and I tell my students all the time, um, don't surrender the Bible to people who are doing things that you disagree with. Study it, read it, wrestle with it. Don't walk away because it says something you don't like. <laughs> Work at it and figure out what this text is about. It matters, and it's important. And so um, just keep at it. I'm delighted you're doing it. So thank you.